does have a equals zero too, right? Oh man. I'm sorry, I'm missing something here. All right, I... Oof. Oh, okay, okay, I, I, I know what I'm forgetting, guys. Uh, we have to start over. I'm so sorry. What we've done is not wrong, it's just not right. Because we don't want to solve this problem. We want to solve, like, we will be greedier. We want to solve y prime prime plus, let's say, ky. Yeah. And in fact, let's make that a k squared. See, if I make that k squared, then our solution has the form y of x is equal to like c1 cosine kx plus C2 sine KX. Sorry to waste your time, guys. I should have d dug through my records and found this before we did this, but like I just keep falling asleep at night. What's that? This is a simple harmonic oscillator kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if I put T there, then we'd have, but yeah, it's a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, you could come up against this, I suppose. Although we have a K there instead, I mean, yeah, you know, but yeah, it's like that. It's like that. So then again, y of zero gives me c1, y of equal to zero, right? y of l, now we get c2 sine of kl. There we go. Equal to zero, which either tells us c2 is equal to zero, boring, boring, or kl equal to n pi for n in the natural numbers without loss of generality because that's what's going to give us a y which is non-trivial. If I put n equals to zero, I'm back to the zero solution again. We're looking for non-zero solutions here, okay? So this tells me that k has to be equal to what? n pi over l. Appreciate the weirdness of what just happened. In differential equations, we tend to do stuff like this. You know, y prime prime plus y equal to zero. You know, you got y of zero is equal to zero. Y prime of zero is equal to one, you know? And you work it out, you get y of t, um, or we could, we could even do x. y of x equal to what? y of x equal to, uh, apparently, sine of x. But it doesn't matter what I put here. There's always a solution, you know? Understand here, there's only a solution to that problem in the, in the context that k is equal to n pi over l. Only when the differential equation matches the boundary values do you get a solution in that sense, right? Like it's in, in the vast majority of, you know, for a given for a given length L, most choices of coefficients for k squared will fail to have a solution which exists. So it's like the bounded states. Yeah, so it, it is reminiscent of that, isn't it? So let me get that initial value problem out of the way. Question, Audric? Uh, so we, this is more than an example. We, we, need, to, we need to call this, uh, we should call this like uh, example one or something. 
Example two. Now, I'm still not doing it right, guys. I'm not doing it right. Instead of putting k squared there, well, golly, I have forgotten my stupid formatting. It's driving me nuts. Well, I'll have to fix it next time, all right? But let's just forge on ahead here with this partly disorganized mess, but we're gonna do the essential mathematical steps here. On the other hand, if you had, you know, y prime prime, and, and goodness gracious. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Usually when I work these problems, I have to go through three different cases. So it's weird to me that I'm not going through the other cases. Um, I, I think what I'm supposed to, I think what I'm supposed to do here, guys, is I'm supposed to put like a, in, instead of a K squared here, I'm supposed to put like a, um, you know, let's say big K, all right? If you don't mind, let me put a big K there. If I do that, then let me just say this, the little, little K is equal to the square root of big K here for k greater than zero, right? Little big k. I'll put I'll put some some feet on the big k. All right. So big k is equal to little k squared. All right. Yeah, yeah. This is it. Now this 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 is fine. This is fine. But you should understand that I should address other possibilities and show that this is the only case there's anything interesting. Okay? So like, all right, so this is, this is the case that big K is what? Positive. What are the other cases? Right. So the other, other case would be, well, let me just say K equals to zero. What do you got? So that gives you Y prime prime equal to zero, right? Which gives you Y of X is equal to say ax plus b. But you've got y of 0 is equal to b equals to 0, and you've got y of l is equal to al, which is equal to 0, so therefore y is equal to 0. So you get nothing. Nothing. What's the other possibility? Well, the other possibility is big K less than 0 then we can write k is equal to minus beta squared for some positive beta. Right? This is an important idea. You definitely want to write a positive thing as the square of something else, and you want to write a negative thing as the square of something else because of the differential equation we're looking at. If I didn't do this, I would be, I would be buried in a sea of sine and cosine of square roots of things. So by making this one kind of weird step, I save myself a multitude of square rooting. <laughs> so now you've got y prime prime minus beta squared y equals to zero. What's the solution of this guy? Well, if you study differential equations, you learn that the solution is y equals to c1 cosh of beta x plus C2 cinch of beta x. Now, yes, all these things can come from the characteristic equation. Fair enough. I mean, the characteristic values are plus or minus beta, so technically you get e to the beta x and e to the minus beta x, but those are horrible for the purpose of boundary value problems because cosh of zero is one, cinch of zero is zero. This is a much better arrangement of the exponentials for our purposes. You want to use cosh and cinch. And now, the boundary values. 
So we get like y of 0 is c1. So that's 0. y of l is c2 cinch of beta l. And that's equal to 0. All right? So what can you guys tell me about that equation? C2 cinch of beta L equal to 0. I mean, it has, I'll do the easy part. C2 could be 0. Is that, is that interesting? C2 equal to 0. Boring. Because that would mean the whole solution that we're looking at is 0. So we, anyway, so you're agreed, cinch of beta L is our only hope. Cinch of beta L equals zero is our only hope, right? And agreed that zero is a solution of that, right? And beta, beta equal to zero. So if beta L is equal to zero, then we get cinch of zero. Cinch of zero, zero. So that's a, a possible solution to this. But beta equals to zero is forbidden, right? So that's out. Because we're assuming L is not equal to zero as well. But here's the thing. Cinch is an increasing function. Because the derivative of cinch, right, is cosh, yeah. And cosh of x is greater than or equal to one. It's smallest when x is 0, and otherwise it just goes up and up, both sides, exponential over 2. So cinch is increasing, therefore it only has one 0, namely 0. Another way of saying this is inverse hyperbolic sine is defined for all inputs. So you can take the inverse hyperbolic cinch of this equation and just get beta L equal to 0. Inverse cinch is 0, 0. So what does all this say? So we get nothing, right? Get nothing. So the, the thing I did first is where everything interesting happened. And this is example one. When faced with this boundary value problem, the solutions are simply this. And what are my solutions? My solutions are y n, right? Equal to what? Equal to sine of kx, but k is n pi x over L. These are called, these are called eigen solutions. And um, various things here get called the eigenvalue, but I'll try to track through that language in chapter five or six of the book. It doesn't quite match up with our previous usage of eigenvalue, as far as I can cipher. Like, I don't think it's quite accurate. Like, I think the use of the word eigenvalue in this discussion is kind of like the use of the word norm in algebraic number theory, Audric. Like, yeah, okay, it's kind of sort of the same idea, but it's definitely not following the same definition of norm, right? They're sort of analogous, but they're not the same. Would you agree? Yeah. So. So this is example one. What, what do you think example two would be? So I'll write it up here. Let's see here. So we actually had to have k equals to what? K, remember k was little k squared, which is actually n squared pi squared over L squared, so just for our future reference. Those are the, those are the only non-trivial solutions to this boundary value problem. And we have to have this constant K is positive and equal to N squared pi squared over L squared. It's non-negotiable. Those are the only non-trivial solutions. And, and again, I can't emphasize enough how weird this is with respect to the rest of differential equations where you write down the differential equation, you take 
any old initial value, initial value problem you like, and you got a unique solution. And the solution, you know, it goes on and on. Now here, <laughs> you know, we start with the boundary values and we find out that there's only certain differential equations which have interesting solutions. Another example, it'll go faster now that I'm on my right, my right mind, um, y prime prime plus, so the same differential equation, okay? But now with y prime of zero equal to y prime of l equal to zero. So um, if we have k equal to zero, what we're going to get? What we're going to get y of x equal to ax plus b. So we have y prime of zero is what? It's just a, and that's equal to zero. And guess what? See, check this out. Do we have any condition on b? See, this is also y prime of l here, right? Because if this is the constant, the derivative is just a. We actually get a solution here. So we obtain y sub 0 equals to 1 as solution for case k equals to 0. So this time, the case k equal to 0 gave us something. Let's look at the um, k less than 0 case again, OK? So then k equals to minus beta squared, our solution c1 cosh beta x plus c2 cinch beta x. Apply the, what, what's y prime? c1 cinch, oh, c, yeah, but beta, thank you. Chain rule, right? C, c1 beta cinch beta x. So we have y prime of 0 is what? It's uh, c2 beta cosh. Well, c, beta, cosh of 0 is 1, right? That's equal to 0. And we have y prime of L is equal to c1 beta cinch of beta L. So the, this one says c2 is equal to 0. And that one, again, because if that has to be equal to 0, what does it force? That forces, you know, forces C1 to be equal to 0 as well. Because beta L can't be 0. Because beta is assumed to be, you know, here, I, I should have said it, beta is positive, all right? Because we want K to be negative, big K to be negative, so. In short, we get nothing. So no, no non-trivial solutions. Now, we could also have the case that k is greater than 0. And then we'd have k equal to, I'll use capital, I'll use beta squared this time, rather than k, if you guys don't mind. Do you, do you want me to use k? I could use k. What's that, Audric? Say again. Do you want me to use k or beta? That's fine. <laughs> That's fine, OK. Very good. So then why? So we're, we're solving y prime prime plus beta squared y equal to 0. So solutions to that are c1 cos beta x plus c2 sine beta x. Now we apply the boundary condition. Well, first of all, differentiate, right? So you get yourself y prime is minus c1 beta sine beta x minus, um, well, plus c2 beta cos beta x. So y prime of 0 is c2 beta equal to 0. And so that, that, that says c2 is equal to 0. y prime of L is minus c1 beta sine of beta L. Aha! This is much akin to what we were 
just doing on the other side of things, right? And so this tells us that beta L must be what? How can I get that to be zero? I have to have beta L equal to what? How, how do I get sine of something zero? Zero or three sixty or seven twenty and n pi, right? Yeah, n pi. pi. No, two n pi, right? No, no, just any 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 multiple of pi will do. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah any. Yep, yep, yep. And again, we're going to assume n is a natural number, without loss of generality, because to assume otherwise is to throw in um, solutions which are negations of other ones, actually, yeah. or it could literally be the same one if we're using cosine. I forget, but anyway, so. Uh, yeah, check it. Beta equal to n pi over L again. And we find that our y sub n is, we could use, let's see here, what was, C, C1 could be, so basically we got cosine of n pi x over L. All right. And this, and, and, and here, apparently kappa, right, I mean big K rather, as I called it, equal to beta squared equals to n squared pi squared over l squared. So here's the answer. We get y sub n. Aw oh, man, look at this garbage I wrote up here. You guys gotta, come on, don't let me do that. It was, it was sine of n pi x over l. I do have some notes which do this all this, this, which write all this up. So I'll have to find those and share those with the guys. So um, this is not really in Nagelsaf and Snyder either, by the way. Like, he does this stuff for they do this stuff for specific examples, but they never come out and just give you like this is what happens. This is the general story for these cases, right? And that's what I tried to do here, because I, I was I was teaching these year after year, and I, and I started noticing there's a pa I started noticing this thing, I was just doing the same thing over and over and over again. I'm like, I should make a theorem so we can kind of make better progress in this material. So I'm proving the theorem for you guys right now. Which I think is more important for you to see since both of you have not had, well, you had different equations, but you didn't do this. But, okay, so then what? What are the other, what are the other flavor options here? Why double prime boundary values? Uh, but there's something else you could do. How about this? Example three, you could be solving y prime prime plus big K y equal to zero with y prime of zero equal to y of L equals to zero. So what we'll do now is we'll put the derivative of zero, zero y of l equal to zero. I believe in this case we're going to find out that the, the interesting case, I'm just going to focus on the interesting case if you guys don't mind. So k equals to um, <coughs> k less than zero. So k equals to minus beta squared. You've got y of x is equal to c1 cosh beta x plus c2 cinch beta x. And so y prime of x is, you know, um, beta c1 cinch beta x plus beta c2 cosh beta x. All right, so let's apply our boundary values. We got y of 0 is what? Well, y prime of 0 is, what is that? So, so the, the cinch drops out, right? Cinch of 0 is 0, so that's, that's gone. And we just get beta C2. Oh, no, not, 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 not differentiating again. I'm just, I'm just plugging zero into that. You're fine. So C2 is equal to zero. And then what's, what's, uh, what's my other y of L, right? Well, y of L is, what is it? It is. Uh, C2 
one hyperbolic cosine of beta L. Oof. The thing is, you guys, I know that hyperbolic sine and cosine can come out to the eigen solutions. I'm trying to find where it is, you know? Maybe this is it. Although I'm starting to feel bad about it. Well, y of l is supposed to be what, zero? Um, oh man, that forces c1 to be zero, doesn't it? Stink. Sines and cosines again, isn't it? Oh, man, I'm not remembering the schnikes. Fine. <sighs> so we've got y equals c1. Cosine beta x plus c2 sine beta x. Y of zero is, well, y prime of zero is what? Um, beta, beta, yeah, I mean, it's beta c2 equal to zero. So therefore, c2 is equal to zero. Y of l is c1 beta sine of, you know, lx equal to zero. So what do we get? We get, you know, well, not LX, my bad, it's L beta, right? So we get L beta equal to N pi. And so um, my K is um, beta squared, which is N squared pi squared over L squared. And my solution is Y sub N equal to what? Co cosine, right? Of n pi l, n pi x over l, k equal to n squared pi squared over l squared. I feel like something's wrong here. second. I'll find it. <laughs> um, y prime of zero should be so C2 zero, right? C1. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Duh, 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 duh. What's Y of L? I'm not, I, I should be plugging it into Y, not Y prime. I plugged it into Y prime. That's why we got the same answer, because I did the same boundary conditions. <laughs> See, this is supposed to be what? <laughs> now that is a different animal. How do you get cosine to be zero? Now that we have not run up against yet. And yeah, I, 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 of course, I still have the the C one out here, right? But anyway. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we need we need L beta to equal to like plus or minus pi over two, or plus or minus three pi over two, right? What's a more elegant way to write that? Oh, okay. So two n. I heard a two n plus one, and then pi, 10 pi over two. Cool. So then my beta, um, my, my beta is actually equal to, you know, 2n plus one times pi over 2l. And so k is beta squared, right? So I get 2n plus one squared pi squared over 4l squared 
right? And then this is cosine of what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 2n plus 1 times pi x over 2l? Yes. So the moral of the story here is each one of these boundary value problems comes with an infinite set of solutions indexed by a natural number. In fact, these are orthogonal with respect to some natural notion of, well, function space. You do the uh, integral, the inner product is just the integral probably from zero to L, right? So the integral from zero to L of different cosines, I, I, I'm, I, I believe they're, I believe they're orthogonal. They're orthogonal if you make the cosines have these kinds of, anyway. Yeah. Now, all right, so let me, this, this in and of itself is, is not interesting. I need to make today interesting. So let's look at something. Let's, let's actually see how Fourier and people like him discovered the need to study analysis. All right, it was actually from some problem like this. Do you guys know what the wave equation is? So what, how's it go? <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's like, like K over I'm just gonna I'll use I'll use U. Um, you know U X X is equal to uh, yeah yeah something like V squared. What, what, say again, what? Um, I got like partial squared y, and, like, um, like, well, I, I guess the way you would write it would be like uh, uxx equal to rho over tau times like vxx, something like that. Well, let's say here, utt, right? I, I want to put a speed in yeah, it. T -T. I want to make, I wanna, this is speed one if I leave it like that. I want to make it more fun than that. Like, let's. Um, I guess we could leave it. Let's, let's talk about the unit speed one. That's not too bad. That's a good starting point. How do you solve this differential equation? So what we're talking about is partial squared u, partial x squared equals to partial squared u, partial t squared, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the, the, the genius idea is to propose that u of xt equals to x of x. Uh, separation. Yeah, separation variables times t of t. And the really neat thing is, if you do this, uxx is going to be equal to x prime prime, all right, times t. And utt is going to be equal to x t prime prime. Now, a wave equation comes with conditions. Like maybe you're looking at zero to L and you want your string to be at, you know, where U and U is this way. All right? X is this way. So you want U of zero to be equal to U of L. You want the, str the, the string to be tied down at the ends, right? So the boundary values we want for this are that u of 0 comma t equals to u of l comma t equals to 0 for all t. And you also want to suppose that there's some kind of initial, the, the string is plucked with some sort of initial shape. So let's say the initial condition is u of, you know, x comma zero is equal to f of x. This describes the initial shape of the string. And actually, since it's a wave equation, that's not enough. You also have to describe its initial velocity as well. So you'd also have to do something like, you know, ut of x comma zero equal to g of x if we were going to go through all of it. 
maybe we won't need to do all that. But anyway, a little rusty. So what you do then is you plug that into the differential equation, what does it give you? It gives you x prime prime t is equal to x t prime prime. Right, plugging these into that. Then we divide both sides by xt. And it gives us x prime prime over x equals to t prime prime over t. Wait, you just said divide both sides by t? By xt. By xt, gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> and, then, and then here is <clears throat> now what we say is we're like, well, function of x, right? This is a function of little x alone. Function of t, right? So the only way that could be is if they're both equal to some constant, which I'm going to call minus big K for my own self-serving purposes. The reason I'm going to call that minus big K is because now we're up against big X prime prime plus big K X equal to zero. And T prime prime plus big K T equal to zero. Check this out. The initial value, the, excuse me, the boundary value problems for the solution. What do they say about the boundary value problem? Is there, 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 it turns out if we just work through it, u of 0 comma t would be equal to x of 0 times t of t. And u of l comma t would be equal to x of l times t of t. And this would be equal to zero. And this would be equal to zero for all t, right? If that holds for all t, and the time solution is non-trivial as we'd like it to be. Are you, are you, right on the other board, or something cut off? Both. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I wrote another board. <clears throat> so here, you see it now. Yeah. Okay. So since those are both, that means that in fact x of 0 has to be equal to x of l is equal to 0, which means I can use the examples I was working out before, you see, get to get solutions, right? So in fact, it tells me that you know, x prime prime plus big Kx equals to 0 implies xn is equal to what? xn of x is equal to apparently the first thing, right? Sine of uh, what? n pi x over l. And, and here where k is in fact equal to uh, n squared pi squared over l squared. And <clears throat> But you see, that k is shared by both. Mm -hmm. So now, on the temporal side of things, we have t prime prime plus n squared pi squared over l squared t equals to 0, which gives me tn of t is equal to like c1 um, cosine of n pi, over, n pi t over l plus c2 sine of n pi t over l. And if we, had, if we had put a velocity into this problem, that velocity would come in here and make an appropriate dimensional modification from the temporal versus the position. That's why there's kind of like a dimensionally unsettling thing going on here in terms of like time divided by length, you know? If the v, if we had v non-zero in the original equation, that would have filtered into adjusting the k for the t versus the x. Right. And so to be clear, I really shouldn't use c1 and c2. I should do something like an 
and bn, like that. And so then what's my solution? Well, my solution is the following form. u of xt, it's equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a n cosine n pi t over l plus b n sine of n pi t over l close bracket, I mean, open close, all times the sine of n pi x over l. This is a Fourier series. It's an infinite series of sines and cosines. Right, yeah, and this is, this is, this is, all this is, this is a, for any choice of a sub n's and b sub n's, this is a solution to the boundary value problem. Now, at the moment, we haven't even touched on the initial conditions. So this in no way reflects, like, the, the initial shape of the string, right? So, like, if you had, just to give a really stupid example, but if you had u of x comma zero equal to, oh, I don't know, sine of n pi x, of just pi x over l, right? If that was your initial condition, in other words, the, um, basically the, 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 you know, the string is what? It's like, basically just like this, right? Then when you plug in zero, Right? What happens when you plug in zero for t? This piece is gone. That, that becomes, right, a sub n sine of n pi x over l. Now, the thing is, sine is a orthonormal set of eigenvectors on the LeBay integrable functions on zero to L. They're orthogonal, which means you can, comp you can equate coefficients. This says A1 is one and A2, in fact, all the higher A's are zero. So this implies a1 equals to 1, and a sub n is equal to 0 for all n greater than or equal to 2. Now, at the moment, the b sub n's are totally free, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So um, I would also have to give you, like, the initial velocity, right? So if I made the initial velocity, you know, like ut of x0 equal to, I don't know, let's make it something easy, like cosine. <laughs> of uh, um, is that what I want to do? Well, you got to be careful here, guys. The thing I haven't done yet is UT. What's UT? Yeah. UT doesn't come for free. <clears throat> what is UT? So I have to differentiate this, right? Um, with respect to t. Differentiate with respect to t, what do I get? Audric, I'm not sure you can see me or not.
Did I get you? Can you push me over a little bit? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So all I did was differentiate our general formula with respect to T. Yeah. And you see now when I, when I plug in UT of X0, what do I get? Well, um, So you see, if I, if I give you an initial velocity for the string, then we can pick out these guys as well. So just for the sake of specificity, let me suppose that I've got, you know, the initial velocity is also, you know, sine of pi x over l for the sake of discussion, right? And I, I hope, hopefully that's physically reasonable. I, you know, you can't just make up any willy-nilly old thing and it may or may not be logical. Um, I get into trouble sometimes making up stuff on the fly. I've been told about this. I, I have formal complaints have been made. But anyway, um, let's see here. So then we get B1. Well, we get 1. We get pi B1 over L is equal to 1 from this. Equating coefficients of the Fourier expansions using the orthonormality of the sine modes. And so B1 is apparently L over pi. So put this all together, what's my solution? My solution is just n equals 1 is the only non-trivial thing, right? And apparently I've got, um, you know, uh, what do I got? I've got cosine um, n equals 1, so pi t over L. And then my b sub 1 was L over pi, so plus L over pi sine of pi t over L times um, the sine of uh, n pi x over L. There's no n, though. n is 1 pi x over L. And there you go. That is the solution to the wave equation. And if you really look at the nuts and bolts of it, it's the orthonormality of the orthonormal systems of the sines and cosine functions. And the thing that's much more interesting is if your initial conditions, right? Um, let me, let me are we, I think we've seen enough of that. I'm gonna, yeah, if you wanna come back over here. And Audrey, I'm gonna, you okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring you back over here, so, um, you know, So you see these right here. If the initial position and initial velocity of the of the wave, you know, of the of the string, what if they're not just sine and cosine? What if they're reasonable functions of x? Then what? You, Exactly. If they're reasonable functions of x, you can approximate with sine and cosine. So in other words, you take your reasonable, you know, your, what's, a, what's a reasonable, a reasonable boundary condition is something where, you know, it's, maybe it's, it's something like this, I don't know, whatever. Well, you can find a Fourier expansion in that. It's going to be infinite. Correspondingly, you'll choose appropriate values of the a sub n's and b sub n's to match that. But you have to be given both an initial position and an initial velocity for the string in order to find both the a sub n's and the b sub n's. But you see, you can, that's, so that's why it's important to understand how to build functions from sin, sums of sines and cosines. But the analysis of infinite sums of sines and cosines is, is touchy because like you can have a convergent sum of cosines, differentiate it term by term and get a divergent series of cosines. Something as simple as term by term differentiation breaks down. So the convergence of sine and cosine to other functions, it implicitly has the idea of almost everywhere in it because of like, you know, you can, um, 
the Fourier expansion of two different functions will be the same if they differ by like, you know, a set of measure zero. Um, at discontinuities, the Fourier expansion, I think, tends to pick the, the average of the jump discontinuities. There's all kinds of things like this. Um, so like, when you, once you start doing this math, it begs questions of analysis. Like it's just, you're going to discover analysis once you start doing this solution. And this solution goes back to Fourier, I think. For, now Fourier did it for the, for the heat equation, right? The heat equation's easier. Heat equation is this, it's uxx equals to like, say, k times ut. And so this is essentially the one-dimensional Laplacian. And so in two dimensions, the heat equation is this. In three dimensions, well, you get the idea. So the heat equation generally would be like Laplacian of u is k times partial u partial t. That describes the flow of heat, you know, in some object. And so the way to do that is to propose a product solution. You plug it in there, and then you find yourself finding Fourier expansions of the initial heat, you know, each initial temperature distribution to, 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 to model the flow of heat and so forth. But anyway, we can, we'll do one of those, maybe like one of the future classes that we have. But I wanted to show you this so that when I, when I get into the next chapter and we look at the sturm level problem, like the boundary value problems there, I don't want it, to, I want it to be a little bit more because what the sturm level stuff is in chapter five is it's, it's generalizing this. It's generalizing the boundary value problem to like a, sort of an arbitrary linear combination of the values and the derivatives of the, the variables that you're bounding. So it's like, it's, it's a general version of this, but it's based on this. So, but anyway, I think I better stop. I am shocked I have not gotten the call yet because I'm way over time. Hey. <laughs>